All right, we are on to criminal justice policy and theory. Criminology. All right, you do want to remember for the quizzes, criminology is the study of crime and punishment. So there are many, and I mean a lot, of different schools of thought regarding crime. And so during this video lecture today, I'm going to cover just some of the more ones that really stood out to me that were important. So a long time ago, torture was really common for those that had committed crime as a way of punishment, um, especially during ancient history. Um, during the second half of the 17th century, a new movement known as the Enlightenment period began. And people in the Enlightenment were interested in crime and what the best punishment should be. And from the Enlightenment school came a thought known as the classical school of criminology which emphasized the ideas that people make choices to commit crime and that punishment should be about preventing future crimes from being committed. So this is a really important page um, for remembering a lot about the study of criminology, also about the classical school of criminology, about the enlightenment period, and there's going to be a couple of questions that you're going to see on the quiz from this page alone. So make sure you understand those schools of thought. All right, so what is the theory of crime? So the theory of crime is a set of ideas that is used to explain a particular phenomena or concept. And again, you're going to, that is something you're going to see again, so remember that. And it is there to help explain what causes crime and why people engage in criminal behavior. The theory of crime is divided into two primary categories, which also you're going to want to remember. One is the micro theories of crime, which focus on individual differences between law abiding and law violating behaviors and the macro theories of crime, which explore the large scale social explanations for crime, such as poverty and community disorganization. So I, I always ask students when we're in class and we do break into discussion groups because this is really important, especially in today's world where we really are talking about ethics and we really are talking about um, looking at crime, looking at rehabilitation, looking at um, focusing on um, what we are doing to those that engage in crime. And so what I'd like you to do is, even though we're not in class, is take this question seriously and really think about what I'm asking you. Uh, think about what you would do. Think about if you were caught, what should happen to you as punishment. And think about if you were the victim of the crime and how you would feel um, what you would want the punishment to be and all those ethical questions. And I can tell you that it's not a simple answer. That's what I can tell you is the one thing I have found um, from being in law enforcement, the one thing I've found from watching the court system, the one thing I've found from being around corrections, the one thing I've found from being a professor, um, from being around criminal justice reform is you're dealing with human beings. And I've seen all, all different sides of it. I've had family members um, that I, I have a, um, a nephew that um, for over a decade started when he was um, in junior high school, became addicted to heroin, um, and was arrested a number of times. Um, I won't go into everything, but it was really, really difficult for my sister and for us and the whole family, and saw very many different sides of the criminal justice system. And, and I can tell you that it, nothing is an easy, easy answer 
as far as when it comes to human beings uh, in the American criminal justice system. And that it's always easy to say something until you're in those shoes. And so really think about this discussion question. And I hope it will do one thing, and that is just to open your eyes to how difficult it is to see things from one side, that there's always a difference um, of opinions, and that I hope you will always open your eyes to realizing that in the criminal justice system because you're dealing with human beings. All right, so let's get here. So, and I've made this more serious than it is. It's not that serious, but I'm, it, it does really make you think. Okay, so imagine that you have the opportunity to steal $1 million. Whoa. Also imagine that you have absolutely no chance of getting caught, which is still the money. And you guys are all going, shoo, I thought this was going to be tough. Well, this is a tough question, okay? Because you probably are all thinking now, it's kind of like that lottery ticket, except I have that word in there still, okay? And that's where this ethics comes in, okay? So I want you to all just take a minute here, and I'm going to time you, okay? Take a minute here to consider, um, would you do it? Imagine you have an opportunity to steal a million dollars, no chance of getting caught. Would you do it? Think of all the bills you could pay. Think of all the people you could help. Even if, I don't know, what would you do with it? Would you do it? No chance of getting caught to steal the million dollars. And actually, I don't want to take up all this time. So pause it and think, okay? Pause it and think about it. And... Um, and I'm going to keep going on before I tell you what, what the normal answer is in my classes, okay? So question two is, now imagine that you have the opportunity to steal the million dollars and you have a 50% chance of getting caught. I want you to pause it, give yourself a minute, and really be honest with yourself. You don't tell anybody, just be honest with yourself. Okay, so pause it, give yourself, write down your answer. What would you do? What's your answer to number one and number two? And, you know, if people were honest to me in the classes, I will, I'll tell you what the answer was. So hopefully you paused it. Hopefully you're honest with yourself. And, and I'll tell you why this brings up so many ethical questions. I can tell you that I, I've taught this class enough and asked this enough that this should bring up ethical questions because it, 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 it has a lot of different tentacles to it in the fact that I've had students say, well, it depends. It depends if I'm stealing from somebody who has just $1 million and they worked all their life to have it, or if it depends if I'm stealing from somebody who has a billion dollars. Um, and I can tell you that generally I only have about one or two students that it doesn't matter ethically, they think it's wrong to steal period. It's wrong to steal and ethically they wouldn't do it. So, and then I had students that talk and say, well, um, people that commit crimes don't always know what house they break into. They don't know the back history of how those people got what they have, who lives there, you know, so start thinking about those things. Um, and then I had asked you to think about your punishment, right? And then I asked you to think about your punishment from the fact that if you were the victim, what if it was somebody took, what if you took, you were the victim that took the million dollars and that was the only million dollars you had and you were 70 years old and you worked all your life for it? You know, you start to see what I mean? That's what I mean, we're, we're human beings. And so these questions have tentacles and we don't always know where these tentacles go. And that's the American criminal justice system. And that's why it's so tough. It's because we always don't know who the suspects are, who are stealing. We always don't know who the victims are, who are getting stolen from. We don't always understand all these things. And so that's why this question, I always start out with this question to get my students thinking. There's no right or wrong answer. The answer is only for you to get you thinking ethically, morally, and thinking about the American criminal justice system, about how in-depth it really is. This is another two things to get you looking at how we all think differently as well. If 
you have ever seen is this dress blue or gold right now i'm hoping i'm hoping some of you are seeing um the dress is black and blue or white and gold um, because right now you're already proving my point that we see things differently um, or on the right and i put a couple links there so if you haven't seen it go do those links right now and go look and see if you see that dress is white and gold or blue and black and then on the right of your screen have you heard that some of you are going to listen to that link and hear yanni and some of you are going to hear laurel um, when that first happened a couple years ago, um, it took me about 10 or 15 minutes. I heard Yanni. I still hear Yanni. And then after I listened to it for a little bit, I hear Laurel. Um, what did you hear? And if you haven't heard it, go listen to it. Let me know. Send me an email what you hear. Um, and again, it just proves that we all see things differently. And again, that's the American criminal justice system. So all I say to you and it's what i used to train my law enforcement officers as keep an open mind we all see things differently um, and don't ever shut your mind to a different way of thinking and that's what that's what's so amazing about our world is always being open to a new way of seeing things um, that's what's amazing about our world all right this um, is amazing. I ask you, um, there'll be an extra credit question on this um, in the upcoming weeks. So this is the time to watch it is right now. It's seven minutes long. You will not regret watching this. Um, our brains are elastic. What? When you watch it, it's amazing. And it talks about, again, um how we can sometimes get set on what we think and and why that cannot be good so and why we need to continually learn and again it's so important for those of you that are interested in the american criminal justice system and so go ahead and pause this right now copy this link go watch it and then you'll be prepared for the extra credit question all right, so continuing on to the classical school theory of crime. So the key principles, um, and again, these are gonna be some things that you wanna remember for the quiz. Um, the key principles of rationality in the classical school assumes that people have free will and that they choose to commit crime. For example, Jordan decides to steal some candy at the store. He's not forced to. Based on some predestiny, he chooses to steal candy. Not only that, he thinks about it beforehand and he says to himself, I really want the candy. I don't have money, so I'm going to steal it. This is rational thinking that goes into his planning to commit the crime. There's also hedonism. The classical school also assumes that people seek pleasure and try to avoid pain. For example, when Jordan looks at the candy in the store, he thinks about how it will bring him pleasure to eat it, so he steals it. And again, you will see those in the quiz. So make sure you understand those meanings and definitions. All right, punishment. Remember how we said the key idea was the idea of hedonism where people seek pleasure and try to avoid pain. For example, Jordan thinks about stealing the candy, then he realizes he could go to jail for it. So he might not steal it because he's trying to avoid jail. Well, there's the idea of deterrence. Deterrence employs the threat of punishment to influence behavior. It assumes that people are rational and people's behavior is a product of free will and people are hedonistic. So their goal is to increase their pleasure and avoid pain. So deterrence, see those green little stars? You're gonna see this again. It discourages action through instilling fear about consequences. The three principles you're gonna see again that's asking you what the definition of deterrence is, is that deterrence should be swift, certain, and severe. Swift is that punishment should be swift and effective. Certain is that people must know they will be punished for their illegal behavior. And severe, it must be severe enough to outweigh the rewards of the illegal action. All right, so crime prevention and deterrence. So your crime prevention triangle says that there's a desire, there's an ability, and there's an opportunity where your crime deterrence triangle says there's the desire, there's the likelihood of being caught, and there's a gravity of harm if caught. And again, remember, if I'm going too fast, just pause this and you can rewind it if you want, because I know sometimes I do talk fast. 
All right, continuing on. Um, deterrence. Punishment must also be proportionate to the harm caused. So if we lose proportionality, there is little to prevent or discourage the criminal from committing more severe crimes and engaging in worse behavior. So the punishment used to keep order is not to avenge the crime. All right, here's classical schools, um, of thought um, from the National Institute. Here's five things that you can go ahead and read that I kind of found that they had that's kind of interesting um, that says the certainty of being caught is vastly more powerful deterrent than punishment. Sending a prisoner to prison is not an effective way to deter crime. Police deter crime by increasing the perception that criminals will be caught in punishment and punished, increasing the severity and punishment does little to deter, deter crime, and there's no proof that the death penalty deters criminal. All right, the rational choice theory. So we have another theory. An example is Chris wants to know why the intruder broke into his apartment and stole his things. So Chris was a victim of a burglary. And the rational choice theory says it's because the intruder was born. Is it because, sorry, Rational choice theory, Chris wants to know, is it because the intruder was born with a biological defect that made him choose that particular apartment? Or is it because something in the intruder's upbringing that made him a criminal? Or was it something else? And the rational choice theory says, and you want to know this because we kind of have that green little star again, is it says criminals make, kind of like rational choice theory says, it's kind of in the name of it, that criminals weren't born that way and they they weren't brought up that way. Criminals just make logical choices about under what circumstances to commit the crime. That perhaps the burglar saw Chris's appointment that Chris's apartment that morning and maybe Chris left the window open and if the window hadn't been left open, the burglar would have moved on, but it was just an easy target because the window was open and it left a opportunity to that made the burglar rationally consider his options and made the apartment an easy target. An important element of rational choice theory is the idea that people will weigh the possible pleasure from committing the crime against the possible pain from punishment and act accordingly. This is known as hedonistic calculus. The word hedonism means seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. And calculus is a type of math. We've all heard of calculus, right? So essentially hedonistic calculus is doing math around the idea of seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. All right, you wanna remember Cesar Beccaria because I will ask who's the founding father of modern criminology? That will be a question and one of the choices will be Caesar, and, and he is the founding father of criminology. Also, I think there might be a question about Jeremy Bentham. Um, no, I don't think there is, but Jeremy Bentham, um, basically classic criminology, rationality, says that human beings will have free will and must have rational choice. Um, there's the neoclassical perspective of criminology is rooted in the classical school. It emphasizes deterrence and retribution and believes that individuals use free will to decide to conform or commit crime and places greater emphasis on rationality and cognition than classical criminologists. Does deterrence work? So does it work? Well, in instrumental crimes, Yes, crimes that bring material rewards and in expressive crimes, crimes that bring psychological rewards. It finds it works better for the instrumental crimes on the crimes that bring material rewards. All right, recidivism. You definitely want to know the definition of recidivism. Very important term in the criminal justice field. It means falling back into criminal behavior. That little picture on the right of the US prison system, that kind of revolving door, that's a good way to remember recidivism. Um, it's a lot more common among ex-convicts and about a third of the released inmates recidivate within the first six months. It's an important thing to remember. 44% within the first year, 54% within the second year, and 67 and a half within the third year. All right, so Sigmund Freud said one can understand human behavior by examining early childhood experiences. 
he gave us the foundations of psychological theories of crime. And he's someone you're going to want to remember. You might see his name again. All right, biological and psychological theories of crime. Several other biological and psychological based theories have emerged. Cognitive developmental theories say the offenders have failed to develop the capacity to make moral judgments. Jean Pijot identified four stages in cognitive development of children. They are the sensor motor stage, which is from birth to two years old, the pre-operational stage, which is two to seven years old, concrete operational stage, seven to 11 years old, and formal operation stage, 12 years and older. Then we have biosocial series theories, which is scholars have combined the knowledge of biological factors of crime with the understanding of social environments. We have modern perspectives that do not identify biological factors as the sole cause of crime, investigative how biological traits can contribute to crime, and interact with social environments to produce criminological behaviors. Then we have sociological theories of crime, macro level theories, and then we have larger social structures, such as environment and institutions, such as schools, peer groups, and family that help explain criminal behavior. We have social disorganizational theory and how neighborhood environments contribute to criminal behavior. Robert Park and Ernest Burgess expanded, examined the city of Chicago in looking at how neighborhood environments contribute to criminal behavior. And they suggested that as cities grow and prosper, residents are either forced out of business zones or choose to exit. And they provided the foundation for the Clifford Shaw and Henry McKay. And they called it the social disorganization theory. And the expansion of factories, immigration, and creation of suburban communities led to the breakdown in the traditional communities. And as a result, a lack of community cohesion and criminal behavior began to rise. It reflected how crime is related to social economic status. And here's a look at Sean McKay's theory of social disorganization. We also have the strain theory, which says people commit crime due to pressure or strain. Crimes are an attempt to reduce or get away from the strain. Theft to escape strain of poverty, violence to end strain of harassment, and drug use to escape the strain of poor lifestyle. The way societies are structured causes strain. We have Edwin Sutherland the differentiation, the differential association theory. And here's Sutherland's principles of differential association. There's a question that will talk about the nine principles, so you'll want to have this handy during the quiz. We also have the labeling theory, which in 1963, Howard Becker suggested that criminality is not a quality inherent in the act or the person and crime results from social definition through a law of unacceptable behavior, and deviance is created by society. Edwin Lemert had basic assumptions of the lab labeling theory. There were primary deviations and secondary deviations. The labeling process started with a label being attached. The second step is the label becomes a master status Third, the labeled person accepts the label. And then the fourth, the self-fulfilling prophecy. We then have the social bond theory from Travis Hershey. And then Hershey's social bond theory of delinquency, which starts with attachments, commitment, involvement, and belief. Then we have a general theory of crime differentiating between criminality and crime, where criminality is the propensity to offend, and crime is an actual event in which the law is broken. We then have the rise of feminist criminology. For much of its history, criminology is focused on men. Empirical studies use male-only samples and theories constructed to explain why men and boys broke the law 
Due to males being disproportionately involved in crime, women's criminality seen as tangently to the crime problem, most early criminologists were male. All right, so as a conclusion, like I said, we have a ton of theories, and we only looked at a few of them. Each perspective has added to a new contribution to the understanding of criminal behavior. No single theory can explain all acts of crime. Each theory has strengths and weaknesses. Here's a look at some of the major criminological theories, such as rational choice theory, biological and biosocial theory, social learning theory, and labeling theory. All right, we will see you for the next series.